Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. President Biden calling on Congress to enact stricter gun laws. That's after three shootings in California left at least 18 dead. 20 states and a conservative legal group are pushing back against the Biden administration's migrant parole program. We look into the lawsuit that calls it an unlawful abuse of parole authority. A new bill aims to prevent members of Congress from profiting from their office. The issue is trading stocks with inside information. Senator Josh Hawley introduces the Pelosi Act. Google sued over its ad business. We take you on a deep dive on how the company's ad supremacy is an international issue and how breaking up the tech giant could thwart the Chinese regime's influence in the U.S. Citizens in rural areas of China have reported local COVID-19 deaths. They say many of those who passed away were elderly. Senator Josh Hawley wants to stop lawmakers and their spouses from trading stocks. He introduced a bill yesterday to do just that called the Pelosi Act. Entity's Daniel Monahan has more on the proposed legislation. The Pelosi Act stands for Preventing Elected Leaders from Owning Securities and Investments. It would force members and their spouses to dispose of any holdings or put them in a blind trust. They would have to do so within six months of entering office. Here's Hawley on Fox News. Members of Congress shouldn't be padding their own pockets and lining uh, their own wallets. They ought to be focused on doing what the people sent them there to do. Members found in violation would have to return their profits to American taxpayers. I, I just think that that is, that is an invitation to all kinds of problems. Last year, a story broke that Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul, traded between one and five million dollars of stocks for semiconductors. The trade came just days before Congress earmarked 52 million dollars for the industry. On Fox News, Representative James Comer said that wasn't the first time Pelosi had done so. He bought stock options ahead of all the big tech hearings. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has in the past defended her husband's transactions, saying he does not use information she's given to him. Paul Pelosi is not the only one. Former Senator Richard Burr sold investments after attending classified meetings on the COVID-19 pandemic. The SEC investigated that matter, but took no action against Burr. Senator John Ossoff, who introduced similar legislation in the past, spoke about the problem on Bloomberg. We saw during the COVID-19 pandemic all of this stock trading by members around the same time as confidential briefings on the threat posed by the virus, trading in medical stocks. Hawley's bill makes allowances for mutual funds, exchange-traded funds, and treasury bond purchases. The efforts to prevent government members from profiting from their public office has bipartisan support. Earlier this year, Hawley introduced a similar bill that would prohibit legislators from trading stocks while in office. While Democratic Senator Mark Kelly also introduced like-minded legislation last year. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Senators grilled Ticketmaster yesterday. They addressed the company's spectacular breakdown last year during the sale of Taylor Swift concert tickets. They also criticized the company's dominance in the ticketing industry. And today's Daniel Monahan brings you more on their concerns. It is time to put forward new legislation. Ticketmaster is the world's largest ticket seller. It processes 500 million tickets each year in more than 30 countries. Around 70% of tickets for major concert venues in the U.S. are sold through the company. Senator Dick Durbin reacts. You want to have real business practices and the strength of the free market system, you need competition. In mid-November, Ticketmaster's site crashed during a pre-sale event for Swift's upcoming stadium tour. The company said its site was overwhelmed by both fans and bot attacks. Many people lost tickets after waiting for hours in an online queue. Senator Amy Klobuchar. I believe in capitalism, and you can't have capitalism when a major company screws up a major concert and there's no one else to go to. The senator says the public has the right to know what's going on. She also called out Ticketmaster for their high fees. Some of the tickets have been shown to be up to 75% fees. That's outrageous. And that's what happens when you have one entity, which is Ticketmaster Live Nation. Meanwhile, Senator Josh Hawley described Ticketmaster's behavior as monopolistic. I mean, this is how monopolies work. You leverage market power in one market to get market power in another market. And it looks like you're doing that in, frankly, multiple markets. You're doing it in the resale market. You're doing it with data. 
The senator also criticized what the fine print of Ticketmaster's digital ticket allows. In other words, you're talking here about data. You're, you're, you're selling effectively the data of all of these people who have not bought direct from you. They want to buy on the resale market, but they've got to come into your ecosystem if you their data in order to get this ticket. Senator Richard Blumenthal also spoke at the hearing. The Democrat criticized Ticketmaster for blaming the pre-ticket sales debacle on Taylor Swift for not having enough concerts. He says the company needs to look in the mirror and say, I'm the problem. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has long vowed to keep two prominent Democrats from serving on the House Intelligence Committee. McCarthy said Representatives Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell would not be allowed on the panel if he won the gavel. Many were wondering if McCarthy would follow through on that promise after Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries nominated them on Saturday. McCarthy made the rejection official yesterday. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on McCarthy's response. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says keeping representatives Schiff and Swalwell off the Intelligent Committee is not a partisan issue. He calls it a matter of integrity in his response that went viral on Tuesday. What Adam Schiff did, use his power as a chairman and lie to the American public. Even the inspector general said it. When Devin Nunes put out a memo, he said it was false. When we had a laptop, he used it before an election to be politics and say that it was false and said it was the Russians. When he knew different, when he knew the intel. The new House Speaker posted his rejection letter to Jeffries on Twitter. He emphasized his commitment of returning the committee to one of genuine honesty and credibility. He added that years of service are not the sole criteria to serve in such an essential role. When a whistleblower came forward, he said he, he did not know the individual, even though his staff had met with him and set it up. So no, he does not have a right to sit on that. Schiff vehemently denies knowing or ever meeting the whistleblower. McCarthy says Schiff will be allowed to serve on other committees. But he will not serve on intel because it goes to the national security of America. And I will always put them first, all right? And if you want to talk about Swalwell, let's talk about Swalwell, because you have not had the briefing that I had. McCarthy went on to say that he and former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi were briefed by the FBI on Swalwell's ties to a Chinese spy, but not until Swalwell was appointed to the Intel Committee. So it wasn't just us who were concerned about it. The FBI was concerned about putting a member of Congress on the Intel Committee that has the rights to see things that others don't, because of his knowledge and relationship with the Chinese spy. They brought it to the works of the leaders. I've got that briefing. So I do not believe he should sit on there, that committee. And I believe there's 200 other Democrats that can serve on that committee. McCarthy finished by saying he will respect voters and allow them to serve on other committees, but not where there are issues of national security. Swalwell called the move an act of political vengeance in response. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The suspected gunman in the Tuesday triple shooting in Yakima, Washington, has died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Authorities found the suspect dead later on Tuesday after he borrowed a woman's cell phone to make a phone call to his mother. They identified him as 21-year-old Jared Haddock. Three people were found dead early that morning at a Circle K convenience store. Two victims were shot inside the store and a third was shot outside. Authorities say the shooting appeared random. The woman who lent the phone to Haddock says she overheard his conversation with his mother. During the call, he allegedly admitted to killing people before stating that he was also going to kill himself. The woman then called the police to inform them of what she heard after getting her phone back from the suspect. After multiple deadly shootings, President Biden is now again calling for stricter gun laws. Meanwhile, a new report by the Secret Service shows that most mass attacks are sparked by disputes and conflicts. President Joe Biden on Tuesday urged Congress to pass gun control legislation. That's after three shootings in California in recent days have left at least 18 people dead. President Biden, like most Americans, believes that this is an urgent issue that too many of our neighbors, colleagues, kids are losing their lives to gun violence. On Sunday, a number of Democratic senators reintroduced a federal assault weapons ban. If passed and signed, the law would prohibit the sale and manufacture of certain firearms, like AK and AR-style rifles. 
it would still permit owners to keep existing weapons. The ban was previously signed into law in the 90s and later expired in 2004. In a Tuesday statement, President Biden said, I once again urge both chambers of Congress to act quickly and deliver this assault weapons ban to my desk and take action to keep American communities, schools, workplaces, and homes safe. With Republicans controlling the House, the proposed legislation is not expected to reach Biden's desk. Also on Tuesday, Vice President Harris said she'll visit Monterey Park to stand and mourn with the community. Harris formerly served as Attorney General and a U.S. Senator in California. The Golden State, where the three shootings took place, is known for strict gun control laws. It has the seventh lowest number of firearm deaths in the country, according to the CDC. Meanwhile, Colorado is expected to introduce its own gun laws. A proposed law would expand the definition of assault weapons to cover a wide array of commonly owned rifles, pistols, and shotguns. The executive director of Rocky Mountain Gun Owners told the Epoch Times that this doesn't just ban many commonly owned pistols and shotguns. This will ban almost 70% of all firearms overnight. You might as well call this the gun owners get out of town bill. And a new report by the U.S. Secret Service shows that half of the mass attacks in the United States from 2016 to 2020 were sparked by personal, domestic, or workplace disputes. A mass attack is defined as the killing or injuring of three or more people in a public or semi-public setting. These were attackers ret retaliating for some sort of perceived wrongs that may have been related to either personal issues, uh, domestic situations with partners, as well as workplace issues. The report found that firearms were used in over 70 percent of incidents, including by some prohibited from owning them. Texas is leading the charge with 19 other states against the Biden administration's new migrant parole program. The Republican states, along with the America First legal group, are suing the administration. They say the program that allows up to 30,000 migrants into the U.S. every month is unlawful. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has more on the lawsuit. The coalition of states is looking to block the parole program. They say it effectively creates a new visa program without going through the formalities in Congress. The lawsuit points out the Department of Homeland Security's parole power is exceptionally limited and can only be used on a case-by-case -case basis. That basis being under urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit. Plaintiffs complained it's an abuse of parole authority to allow up to 360,000 aliens to enter in a year. The program allows tens of thousands of migrants to enter the U.S. from Haiti, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela each month. Applicants need to pass a background check, have a sponsor in the U.S., and enter by flying into the country. It puts them on two years of parole and lets them get work permits. President of the America First Legal Group, Stephen Miller, says the program lacks legal basis and gives illegal aliens pre-amnesty. The Biden administration says it thinks the new measure has lowered the amount of illegal crossings at the southern border from migrants from the designated countries. They admitted that overall encounters are up, but say that's because smugglers are spreading misinformation about the end of Title 42. The administration currently has two legal challenges before the Supreme Court, one regarding Title 42 and the other on interior immigration enforcement. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Just ahead, America's largest banks are working on an electronic wallet. The effort is in a bid to compete with Apple Pay and PayPal. And U.S. Railroad Posts report record earnings in 2022 after narrowly averting strikes by union workers. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. America's largest banks are working to compete with Apple Pay and PayPal. Seven major banks, including Bank of America, Truist, and Wells Fargo, are working with Early Warning Services, the company that runs their Zelle electronic payment service. The new electronic wallet, which will operate separately from Zelle, would allow people to make online purchases. Right now, Zelle primarily allows transfers of funds between people who know each other. The digital wallet is an attempt to regain banks' control of purchases currently being made using Apple Pay and similar services. The new digital wallet is due to launch later this year. 
Some 35,000 PayPal user accounts were hacked by credential stuffing, resulting in exposed names and social security numbers. In a letter, PayPal said the accounts were breached sometime between December 6th and December 8th. It said almost 35,000 users were impacted by the incident. The hackers used a credential stuffing attack that involves automatically injecting login credentials that were found during previous data breaches. The company said it has reset passwords on the afflicted PayPal accounts. Impacted users will also get free identity monitoring services from Equifax. Sam Curry, the chief security officer at Cyber Reason, told Forbes magazine that passwords from previous hacks could be used because people often reuse passwords. So in his words, the hackers were able to brute slam PayPal accounts until they found 35,000 matches. The Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against Google on Tuesday. It's accusing the tech giant of abusing its dominance in digital advertising to squash competition. For 15 years, Google has pursued a course of anti-competitive conduct that has allowed it to halt the rise of rival technologies, manipulate auction mechanics to insulate itself from competition, and force advertisers and publishers to use its tools. In so doing, Google has engaged in exclusionary conduct to severely weaken, if not destroy, competition in the ad tech industry. Google responded by saying the government was doubling down on a flawed argument that would make it harder for small businesses and publishers to grow. This lawsuit is the second federal antitrust complaint filed against Google. The DOJ's first lawsuit was filed in 2020. It accuses the company of monopolizing Internet search. That suit is scheduled to go to trial in September. According to insider intelligence, Google remains the leader in digital ads by a long shot. However, its share of U.S. digital ad revenue fell to 29% in 2022 from 37% in 2016. Eight states joined the DOJ in the lawsuit, including Google's home state of California. Next, we take a deep dive into the lawsuit against Google over its ad business and over alleged monopolistic practices. We hear from a former employee at the company on the tech giant's ad dominance and how breaking up the company could disrupt foreign influence. Joining us to discuss is Google whistleblower Zach Voorhees. Zach is a former senior engineer at Google and YouTube. It's really great to have you on the show today, Zach. Thank you very much, Kevin. It's good now to be here. that the DOJ and eight states are coming after Google in efforts to break up its ad tech business, what do we know here? Is the company going to continue to deny that it dominates the online ad market? Do you expect it will divest in part of its business in some way? What can we expect from Google here? Um, Well, you know, Google has an effective monopoly on the ad market. It's both the auctioneer and the broker. And what it's been caught doing is rigging its own auctioneerings for the ad revenue market and gouging everyone else of their ad revenue. Uh, They also play favorites. Uh, You can, you know, advertise on the Google network until you say something disfavorable and then you can get cut, uh, as we saw with Breitbart. And this is an international issue. You know, multiple countries around the world are putting pressure on Google because of their abuse of their ad tech monopolies. And the United States is coming to that same question. Do we want to have any semblance of free speech or do we want Google to control everything that everyone says, including the New York Times and the Washington Post? Now, what are the relations between the Chinese market and this as well? Well, you know, Google has spent a lot of time trying to enter into the Chinese market. Um, that's been only somewhat successful, uh, but unfortunately, they've kind of accumulated a lot of um, Chinese interest into their company. Um, and so um, I, I see what's going on here as sort of a defense against the CCP and being able to, you know, control what is allowed to be said in Americans' uh, news market. And so I see this as sort of a, an attempt to divest the CCP away from the United States news market. So what can you tell us about the DOJ's efforts here, as well as what's publicly available and free speech for journalists and how all of this kind of mixes together here in terms of Google? Well, the DOJ is being joined by uh, eight states, including uh, New York, uh, in filing this. Um, it's clear that uh, they want to take Google's ad revenue business and split it up into different companies. Uh, Google has been fighting back and trying to come to a 
deal with the DOJ saying, well, we'll split the company, but we want to keep it under the umbrella of Alphabet. Um, apparently, talks have broken down. They can't come to an agreement. And so the DOJ is pressing forward with their plan to uh, you know, bring antitrust action and to break up the ad tech business away from the rest of Google's business. And, you know, um, Google is essentially an ad business. Um, it does a lot of other technologies, but they don't make very much money. Most of them make no money or lose money. It's essentially a money printing machine when it comes to its ad tech business. And if the DOJ sort of slices that off from the rest of the company, the rest of the company will just sort of die because it, it is their ad monopoly that funds Google's, um, you know, coffers. And so um, going after this uh, monopoly here with its ad business will effectively end Google, in, in my opinion. That is, that is very interesting. Now, in terms of Google's ad business, Google says the government is using a flawed argument that would make life harder for small businesses. Can you explain their reasoning and give your perspective on this? Um, so, look, how can small businesses be harmed any more under you know, what the current regime of Google search and ad business is? Um, if they say the wrong thing, they're gone. And so you know, this has really been... Um, you know, a pain for small businesses to be dealing with Google's monopoly and control over the internet. And so I can't imagine that their argument that it's going to be bad for small businesses is going to fall on any receptive ears. Um, they just seem like, you know, excuses by a big corporation that is trying to run away from, you know, the, um, the consequences of its, you know, cartel-like actions. Former senior engineer at Google and YouTube, Google whistleblower Zach Voorhees, it is such a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you very much, Kevin. Union Pacific reported another year of record earnings yesterday. The company's net income for the year rose to $7 billion. That's up about half a billion or 7% from the previous record profit it posted for 2021. Most of that went to employee pay and benefits, which also rose by about half a billion dollars over the year. Union Pacific was among the major freight railroad companies that successfully fought off union demands for paid sick days for workers during contentious labor negotiations in 2022. The companies narrowly avoided a strike by their unionized workers when Congress imposed new contracts on about half of their union members in December. The new labor contracts give its workers an immediate 14 percent increase in pay, including back pay. The company also spent $6.3 billion repurchasing shares of stock. A former Columbia University gynecologist convicted on federal sex abuse charges. Robert Haddon was convicted of enticing and inducing individuals to travel interstate to engage in illegal sexual activity. The allegations against the 64-year-old first became widely publicized after Evelyn Yang, the wife of former Democratic presidential candidate Andrew Yang, came forward with allegations of sexual assault. That prompted more women to come forward. Haddon was convicted on four counts, each of which carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. The San Diego City Council voted Tuesday to end the city's COVID-19 emergency declaration at the end of February. That includes the employee vaccine mandate. The emergency declaration has been in effect since March 17, 2020. The mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policy requires city employees, elected officials, and volunteers to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. The mandate was challenged in court by a citizens group called Reopen San Diego. It alleged that the mandate kept an entire category of individuals from meaningful participation in city government. The suit stated that it barred unvaccinated city officials and volunteers from attending city meetings or business in city buildings. Should a California school district have to recognize a Christian club that bans LGBT students from club leadership positions? A federal appeals court is set to reconsider the issue. A previous ruling required San Jose Unified School District to recognize the Christian Student Club. The district had objected to the group's policy that prohibits LGBT students from being club leaders. That ruling found the school district discriminated against the fellowship of Christian athletes based on religious beliefs. 
An appeals court vacated that decision. A new hearing is set for March in Pasadena, California. The Food and Drug Administration is proposing measures to limit lead exposure in baby food. The goal is to eliminate any potential risks to children under two. It says the draft guidance would result in significant reductions in exposures to lead from food. It would also ensure the availability of nutritious foods. The draft guidance relates to foods packaged in jars, pouches, tubs, and boxes. Lead is a toxic heavy metal. It can harm the brain, nervous system, and other vital organs, especially in children. The FDA said it's not possible to remove lead entirely from the food supply, but the recommended levels are expected to push manufacturers to lower lead levels in their products. And just ahead, people in Wuhan are remembering a group of citizen journalists. Three years ago, they reported on the COVID outbreak despite pressure from the Chinese Communist Party. Where are they now? And Beijing has updated its COVID-19 count for the second time, claiming a death increase of 12,000 nationwide. Some residents give different numbers. We'll have the details soon when we return. We're entering an unprecedented period of economic turmoil. The economy is unstable. Our government is in shambles and the global war on energy has created a domestic crisis. Americans need a way to protect their financial future. One way to ensure your wealth in retirement is by purchasing physical gold and silver. We can help. You can roll any part of your retirement account into a gold or silver IRA. Better yet, you can open a gold or silver IRA in five minutes or less using our online application. Preserving your family's financial legacy is a choice that's always available to you. And when you're ready, we're here to help. Call us and speak to one of our IRA professionals. Let's build your financial legacy together. GSI Exchange, wealth for generations to come. Welcome back. More reports of deaths in China's rural areas and a list of citizen journalists has emerged. They were the first to expose the outbreak in Wuhan three years ago, but were forced into silence by the communist regime. Entity's Don Ma brings us more. New reports coming in from citizens in China. Farmers from several regions told Entity about what's actually happening locally. They say many elderly people in their communities have died from COVID-19. Here is more from one of them in China's eastern Zhejiang province. Many elderly people living in rural areas died this year. Some of them committed suicide because they couldn't put up with the pain after being infected with COVID-19. In my village, one elderly person jumped into a river. Another in a nearby village jumped into a pond. Yang said there's also a drug shortage in local hospitals and that those infected with the virus struggle to get medical treatment. In China's southern Hunan province, a farmer said five people in his social circle died from the COVID-19 virus. Within my brother's social circle, 10 died from the virus. And now moving on to north China's Hebei province, a woman there said a father and son living in her residential compound both died from the virus on the same day. The father died in the morning and the son passed away in the afternoon. It's so sad. Bao explained that her local funeral home was overflowing. So family members now must transport their dead to another nearby crematorium. The anniversary of the world's first COVID-19 lockdown passing quietly in central China's Wuhan. Authorities imposed a strict shutdown on the Chinese city three years ago after COVID-19 first emerged there in 2019. On Monday, Chris Anthemums began to appear on Wuhan streets. But instead of celebrating the Lunar New Year, the blooms served a more somber purpose, which is to mourn the loved ones lost in the most recent wave of COVID-19. In 2020, Wuhan's 11 million residents were cut off from the world for 76 days. A list of citizen journalists who disappeared from Wuhan also emerged. They vanished from the public eye after reporting on early research into the pandemic's origin and the harsh reality of the outbreak in the city. 
觉得前面是病毒，后边又是那样的一种可能会被抓的恐惧。Li Zhehua, a former state broadcaster turned citizen journalist, went missing after allegedly being followed. He previously claimed COVID-19 came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Citizen journalist Fang Bin remains missing after police detained him in Wuhan. Chen Qiushi was detained for more than a year and now remains under surveillance. What's more, lawyer turned citizen journalist Zhang Zhan received a four-year prison sentence. She's been detained since May 2020. CNN reported Chinese police detained at least 47 citizen journalists for reporting on COVID-19 outbreaks in Wuhan. Chinese health authorities are releasing a second update on the nation's COVID-19 death toll. This time, over 12,000 people reportedly died in hospitals between January 13th and 19th. That number is up from the official figure of 60,000 from one week earlier. Is the new number credible? Let's hear from some voices inside China for more. In the northern province of Shanxi, a doctor disclosed figures he learned about the local COVID-19 death toll. To protect his identity, we gave him a pseudonym. More than 300,000 people live in our county. Over 4,000 were said to have died during this time. In one single village, there were dozens of deaths. Too many bodies wait to be burned. Cremation is available after one and a half months of waiting. Prices for wreaths and coffins are all soaring. They're out of stock and hard to buy. Lee explained that many people have passed away in the region, both elderly and young, adding that some of them died suddenly while recovering from the infection. There are 700,000 people living in the city. I heard that 5,000 have died. In the neighboring Shangxi province, a resident gave more details. He explained that usually local funeral homes only need to work in the morning to meet demand, but now people line up outside the buildings at night, waiting for the next day's cremation services. And that's not all. A new funeral home was built here, with several furnaces burning non-stop, and a decommissioned crematorium was reopened. In rural areas, if there's no place for cremation, villagers simply bury the deceased in the ground. A funeral home in southeastern Jiangxi Province revealed more on Chinese social media. The source said that in previous years, the number of deaths in the country totaled less than 100 in December. But last month, the figure was over 6,000, a whopping 60-fold increase. Staying in Asia, nine crew members are missing after a cargo ship sank off the coast of Japan. South Korean and Japanese coast guards are still searching for them. The vessel, called Jintian, was registered in Hong Kong. It was carrying 22 crew members, all from China or Burma, also known as Myanmar. The Japanese coast guard said a distress call came from the ship late last night. The area where the ship sank is in southwestern Japan, close to South Korea. The two countries' coast guards have so far rescued 13 crew members. Planes and ships, including private vessels, are assisting in the search for the nine missing. Russia, China, and South Africa plan to hold joint exercises in February off the coast of South Africa. Moscow says it will send a warship armed with hypersonic weapons. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, the frigate Admiral Gorshkov is joining the training armed with Zircon hypersonic missiles. A commander says the weapon can be employed at a distance of more than 550 miles. State media reports the frigate conducted air defense exercises earlier in the Norwegian Sea before heading to the Atlantic Ocean for assigned missions. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And still to come, Germany decides to supply Ukraine with 14 of its advanced Leopard 2 military tanks. We'll return with that and more after this break. Germany has agreed to send advanced battle tanks to Ukraine. The decision ends weeks of speculation on whether the country would overcome its reluctance to send weapons into the conflict. We will also supply Leopard 2 battle tanks to Ukraine. That's a result of renewed intense consultations with our allies and international partners. I would like to underline that it was right and that it is right and that we didn't let ourselves be driven, and that we instead counted and will continue to count on close cooperation for such an issue. 
Germany will also give other countries that want to send their Leopard 2 tanks the green light to do so. Berlin approved the required for is re, Berlin approval is required for German-made tanks to be delivered to a non-NATO country. Poland and Finland have been eager to send their Leopard 2 tanks to help Ukraine face Russia. Germany says it will start training Ukrainian forces in how to operate the tanks. Germany also plans to provide logistical support, maintenance and ammunition for the 14 tanks it's handing over. The Kremlin says the move undermines Russian-German relations and the equipment will go up in flames. The head of the Union of German Military Personnel told ZDF TV that while shipping the Leopards to the battlefront is good for Ukraine, it's bad for the combat readiness of German forces. Relations between Russia and Estonia have sunk to a new low over Ukraine. The two countries are now expelling each other's ambassadors in a tit-for-tat move. The Russian foreign ministry summoned the Estonian ambassador Monday and ordered him to leave the country by next month. The ministry said the move was made in retaliation to Estonia downsizing the Russian embassy in Tallinn. Estonia then announced in response that the Russian ambassador will need to leave by the same day. In a show of solidarity with its Baltic neighbor, Latvia says it will also downgrade a diplomatic relations with Moscow. The Baltic countries are among those urging NATO members to send more battle tanks to Ukraine in its war against Russia. The British government is seeking to enact robust measures to prove the age of asylum seekers. It comes as an Afghan man who lied about his age to enter the UK was found guilty of murder. The prime minister's spokesperson said scientific age checks are already in place in other countries and the UK will look to follow suit. More on this from NTD's Malcolm Hudson. Downing Street wants to implement robust measures to verify the ages of asylum seekers. Unaccompanied minors seeking asylum get treated differently from adults, so some grown men take advantage of this by lying about their ages to get into the country. The government is seeking to avoid this type of situation. Their decision comes as Lawangin Abdul Rahimzai, an Afghan man, was on Monday found guilty of murdering 21-year-old Thomas Roberts last year, a case Downing Street has described as shocking. Abdul Rahimzai claimed he was five years younger than his true age to enter the UK. The Home Office has been aware of this fake age issue for some time, previously warning that it's a significant problem among migrants crossing the English Channel in small boats. An infamous case was of an Iraqi man who claimed to be 16 but was found to be over 18. He set off a bomb on the London Underground in 2017, injuring 69 victims. Currently, age checks rely on interviews with social workers, but a report by an advisory committee earlier this month said these interviews could be supported by biological age assessments like x-rays or MRI scans to determine the development of teeth and bones. Although campaigners have questioned the ethics and reliability of these methods, the Prime Minister's spokesperson said scientific checks are already in place in countries like Sweden, Norway and Denmark. So the UK is now looking to follow in their footsteps. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News London. A UK teachers union said many schools will close during strikes next week. The National Education Union said it received over 20,000 new members after announcing seven days of strikes in February and March. The union has called on school leaders to let parents know before February if they plan to shut their doors during strike action. The union said it expects more than 100,000 teachers to strike. The Department for Education suggests schools could use agency staff and volunteers with schools expected to remain open where possible. But many parents are still waiting to hear if they will need to make child care arrangements as school leaders try to work out whether they can keep their doors open. Croatians are angry about what they believe are unwarranted price hikes happening in stores. That's after the Balkan country joined the Eurozone on January 1st. Um, milk, eggs, I guess all of the prices are went up really high. This month, Croatia is replacing its national currency kuna with the euro. And many accuse the country's retailers of capitalizing on the situation. Some experts say shops are rounding up prices denominated in euros or suddenly raising prices by as much as 50 percent instead of converting at the given rate. Realistically, everything became more expensive. I was just at a store now and the prices of everything went up. Retailers blame inflation for the price hike, 
but the government has taken the public side. Last week, authorities inspected almost 1,000 stores, and about a quarter were fined for unreasonable price rises. When I look at just the most basic necessities, like butter, bread, milk, the prices are unbearable now. It's not the increase they warned us about. It's 10 or 20 percent. Yet some argue that claims of price hikes are simply a different perception of prices. Croatians are used to calculating prices from the lower kuna figure to the larger euro figure, a process now reversed in their new reality in the eurozone. I think all that talk about price hikes is a bit overblown. Every single country which introduced the euro had problems like these. It is us who have to get used to calculating from euros into kuna, because mentally we still convert prices into kuna first, instead of basing our map on euros. The country's three major telecom providers have announced price increases for February. Banks are also reportedly planning to raise interest rates on new mortgages. Spanish police have arrested members of a gang that ran illegal tobacco factories across Spain. They seized contraband worth nearly $40 million. Police arrested 27 alleged gang members. They seized packets of tobacco without a tax seal and tobacco leaf. The gang sold the contraband packets in Spain and other European countries. Police searched three clandestine tobacco factories equipped with state-of-the-art machinery. Authorities say the gang exploited Ukrainian refugees who lived in cramped conditions and worked long hours. The EU parliament says exploitation of Ukrainian refugees is on the rise as their situation sometimes forces them to take underpaid and informal work. The Colombian Navy has seized over four tons of cocaine hydrochloride. Authorities discovered the illicit cargo after intercepting a semi-submersible on Monday. Drone footage shows the ship being dragged and taken to a dock. According to police, the operation took 11 million doses off the market. The operation was a joint effort of the Colombian Navy, Coast Guard units, naval aviation and foreign aid. Four members of the crew were detained. An investigation into the alleged offense of trafficking, manufacturing, and transporting narcotics is now underway. This year alone, the Colombian Navy has seized nearly 10 tons of cocaine hydrochloride. And still to come, ball season is underway in Vienna after a two-year hiatus. We'll take you to the Philharmonic Ball, one of the highlights of the long tradition. And it's Haute Couture Fashion Week in Paris. This year, an auction features a wardrobe made up of famous French designers. Stay tuned for more on that when we return. A performance that truly matters. For each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. The Fixture Pioneer, CGN. Professional AI intelligent fixtures. All-round integration of four systems. High precision, high durability, high quality. 2 micrometer repetition accuracy, more than 80 patent certificates, ISO 9001 approved. Precision clamping to meet your every need. CGM has it all. Pride of Taiwan, CGM. Good to have you back with us. Vienna is finally entering ball season after a two-year hiatus. The Philharmonic Ball is celebrating its 80th anniversary with the Austrian Chancellor in attendance. Entity's Andrew Thomas has more on the classy affair. Vienna is finally waltzing again following pandemic lockdowns. The city has a long ball tradition dating back to the 18th century. I think it's special for all Viennese, Austrian, and not only. But this is a very special ball. I've been here several times and always I enjoy that. And this year it's, it's very, very special because we miss it for two years. And I think every one of us miss some happiness and joy and uh, dancing. 
Attended by celebrities and the Austrian Chancellor, the Philharmonic Ball is truly one of Vienna's ball season highlights. The ball tradition is a special one in Austria, and above all, what is special now is that it can start again, that we can meet again, we can celebrate again, we can dance again, but above all, we can talk to each other and have a good time. The Viennese consider the Philharmonic Ball as one of the most elegant, and the dress code is strictly enforced. A black jacket and a white tie are required for men, while floor-length ball gowns are mandatory for women. White ties are compulsory attire at the main balls, such as the Philharmonic Technical Circle Opera Ball. The white tie is the most elegant form of dress for a gentleman in the evening, followed by a dinner jacket and then a dark blue suit. And accessories are just as important. So, while wearing a white tie, it is actually compulsory that you wear a pocket watch. If you wear a watch, then you put the pocket watch chain on between the middle button of the waistcoat and then in the right pocket. A tailored white tie costs between $7,000 and $11,000. Off-the-rack white ties cost around $2,000. In the middle of a cost-of-living crisis, this ball might be a little too pricey for most. But with over 400 balls planned in the city this year, the Viennese have plenty to choose from. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A wardrobe full of pieces by famous French designers is up for auction. The sale is part of Paris Haute Couture Fashion Week, which kicked off on Monday. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Christie's is auctioning a wardrobe owned by a Parisian woman who rubbed elbows with famous designers. The 116-lot auction features playful cocktail dresses, elegant evening gowns, and more haute couture. It's really a world world, meaning that all these pieces belong to the same client, and this client, she wore everything. She chose everything and she wore everything. Of course, she only wore pieces once or twice, particularly the one were very, very spectacular. The most valued item in the sale? This purple velvet dress from Chanel's 1988 winter collection. The Tudor-inspired dress is estimated to be between $4,000 and $6,500. The auction also features several pieces by Yves Saint Laurent. This gold lame encrusted tunic and matching pants outfit is a nod to the designer's love for Moroccan culture. I mean, we have a lot of Saint Laurent pieces in the sale because the client loves Saint Laurent and you know, all haute couture clients, they said that the Saint Laurent um, outfits are the most comfortable and the more feminine and sensual. Most of the couture pieces were bought in the 80s and 90s. The owner also had friendships with the designers. She was very close to Karl Lagerfeld for Chanel. She was also very close to Yves Saint Laurent and she was a very good friend um, to Hubert de Givenchy. So these three, we have a lot of pieces. Then you also have a lot of Christian Lacroix, beautiful Lacroix from the early 90s. Christie's Art Couture auction started on January 11th and runs until January 25th. The auction has attracted fashion museums and fashion houses, but a number of aficionados are also making bids. It's not really a collection because um, it's very intimate actually, this is very personal stuff. The Paris Art Couture Fashion Week allows top-end designers to show off elaborate creations. They don't tend to be mass-produced for stores, instead they're typically sold to private clients. Haute Couture Fashion Week wraps up January 26th. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Tucked in a valley surrounded by snow-capped peaks, a town in Switzerland is hosting a hot air balloon festival. It's drawing thousands of spectators and flying enthusiasts. It's held in the town of Chateau d'Oex. During a nine-day celebration ending on Sunday, January 29th, 60 brightly colored hot air balloons from 15 countries will soar through the sky over the valley. It's an area known for winds that make for particularly good flying. Other programs of the festival include night shows, sporting competitions, and a children's day. Thomas Vildoren, a hot air balloon pilot from Belgium, is participating in the festival. The, the special thing about uh, flying in uh, Chateau is uh, that we can take off in the morning, fly uh, in one direction, and come back in the afternoon due to the anabatic and the catabatic winds. Uh, it, uh, in the afternoon, it just turns around the wind. The hot air balloon pilot says every trouble in daily life just seems so small when you go up in the air. You go with the wind, you go with the flow. 
Some hot air balloon flights had to be canceled on Monday due to unusually strong winds, but festivities fully resumed the next day. The Swiss town has been hosting the International Hot Air Balloon Festival for over 40 years. This year marks their 43rd edition. Turning 100 years old is already quite an achievement, but Italian twins Francesca and Maria Ricciardi went one step further. They're celebrating their 200th birthday. That's 200 years between the two of them. Relatives and 50 grandchildren and great-grandchildren celebrated with the centenary twins. They enjoyed a big birthday cake with a 200 written on it. Francesca Ricciardi said she didn't imagine they would live this long. She says, quote, it's a gift from the Lord to get this get this age. She adds, with the life we had, we could never have made it to 100 years old. Among the guests was the mayor of an Italian town. He is also one of the twins' many grandchildren. Francesca and Maria always worked in the fields as farmers and as embroiderers, and they've never moved from their small village. And coming up, more than 30 films are competing for this year at the for competing this year for the BAFTAs, the highest film accolade in the United Kingdom. Which ones are on the list? Also in the UK, as the country grapples with a looming recession, a robust plush toy market has manufacturers excited. We'll be back with more soon here on NTD News. Over 30 films have been nominated for this year's BAFTAs, or British Academy of Film and Television Arts Awards. Britain's top film honors will be awarded on February 19th in London. Let's have a look at some of the nominated films. A German remake of the anti-war classic All Quiet on the Western Front led nominations for this year's British Academy Film Awards, overtaking other awards season favorites with 14 nods. The Netflix film is based on the epic 1928 novel by German author Erich Maria Remarque about the horrors of World War I. It was recognized in the Best Film category as well as for film, not in the English language. Director, supporting actor, adapted screenplay, original score, and other craft prizes. Have you been rowing? Have you been rowing? Dark Comedy, The Banshees of Inisherin, secured 10 nominations. Banshees is a tale about two feuding friends in a remote island off the west coast of Ireland. In that moment, I watched that skinny boy transform into a superhero. Buzz Luhrmann's biopic, Elvis, came in third, with nine nominations, including for Best Film and the Leading Actor recognition for Austin Butler. The Korean romantic thriller Decision to Leave received a nod for Best Director. Other nominations include The Batman and Top Gun Maverick for Best Cinematography and Best Special Effects. Avatar The Way of Water was also nominated for Best Special Effects and in the Best Sound category. While Britain is sliding toward a recession, one product is booming in its market, plush toys. At a toy fair in London, some manufacturers explained why. The London Toy Fair brings a wide variety of plushies. These are now the fastest growing toy category in the UK, with millions of sales. So the plush part of the toy market, which are very much the soft, squidgy toys, teddy bears, etc., was the fastest growing sector of the toy market last year. It grew by 29% uh, and it was very much driven by those traditional toy uh, elements. A perfect case study for the plush craze is the cuddly pillow-like Squishmallows. Toy manufacturer Jazzwares calls 2022 and 23 the year of the Squishmallows. Um, we saw a 500% increase in sales of Squishmallows, so a huge part of that will be down to these lovely guys here. Uh, we sold close to 3.5 million units just in the UK last year. Last year, the UK toy market shrank by 3% amid a cooling economy, when consumption took a hit from rising food and fuel prices. Despite the decline, the industry is still worth more than $4 billion in the UK alone. 
Chicago-based toy maker Ty is no stranger to the boom. And to be honest, plush always climbs in a recession because people stop buying tech and they look at everything else they're spending their money on and they always go to plush because it's a feel-good gift you can give to anyone. With prices ranging from $6 to $60, Squishmallows enter the market with a pocket money price point. But what seems to be driving sales is their multi-generational appeal. It's not a toy in the normal sense. It's not just for kids. You know, 18 to 24 and that Gen Z demographic are really, really buying into this brand. So you can, you can have a Squishmallow if you're five years old. You can have a Squishmallow you know, if you're you know, way, way into adulthood. So that is really what's driving it as well. Squishmallow's seven and a half inch plush recently won the coveted Toy of the Year award. The company has also licensed popular franchises, including Disney, Harry Potter, and Star Wars. Country music star Chris Stapleton is handing over his CMA Vocalist of the Year crown and putting on another, the Super Bowl performer one. The NFL just announced he'll be belting out the star-spangled banner for the biggest night in football. The Kentucky native is known for hits like Tennessee Whiskey, Parachute, and Starting Over. He'll be joining stars like Rihanna, who is set to perform at halftime. This year's Super Bowl will be in Glendale, Arizona on February 12th. A big happy birthday to Fiona, the star hippo at the Cincinnati Zoo. She just turned six years old yesterday and received a special gift. The zoo ordered a birthday cake for her as a celebration. The aquatic mammal has gained international attention since her birth in 2017 because she was born prematurely. She was a record 29 pounds at birth. The figure was remarkably low considering that hippos typically weigh 100 pounds at birth. Despite the odds, Fiona thrived. She is now a major attraction at the zoo. Fans can sign up for the ultimate hippo tour on the Cincinnati Zoo's website. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.